Thanks, Jace. Good evening. Good evening. Wow, I can't believe this is the 14th <laughs> class. How did that happen? All right, well, uh, yeah, we'll be doing some things in the, in the, in the fall, so, so don't worry. This is not the last class, just of this short season. So tonight's class, class 14, I have titled The History of Natural Medicine. Uh, trust me, I had to pray a lot about what to talk about tonight. Um, and, and I, I kind of came to the, the conclusion that the bottom line, uh, bottom line, what was in my heart, is that you know, our, our goal in this world, on this earth, and, and this time in our lives is to be a shining light, to be a shining light for Christ. And it's so easy to get caught up in a lot of the negative, evil, bad things that are happening uh, in the world. And, and I've actually... Just a personal story real quick is, is I've, I had a, a, a season in my life where I was really, really caught up in that stuff. I mean, really caught up in it, studying it, watching, reading all these things, and realizing that I was really focused on negativity, and I wasn't focused on Christ, and wasn't focused on reading the Bible, and wasn't focused on, you know, being a shining light, and um, it's not a good place to be. So what I really felt in my heart that I wanted to share with this in, in this class is, is not speaking negatively um, about some of the things going on, but instead actually sharing some true stories of some real people and some real therapies that have been used in, in the natural health industry in America over the last couple hundred years. And I think that alone is going to shine a lot of light uh, as to what's uh, going on right now in, in the medical community. I also feel like I really need to stress the fact that some things I am saying might seem hard to believe. I encourage you, as always, to not believe me, but search it out, seek it out, study it for yourself, and um, come to your own conclusions. And, and, and test the validity of, of some of these stories. What's really important is to understand, I guess, the big picture. I mean, the big picture of, of for lack of a better way to say it, the battle of good versus evil. The spirit behind a lot of the things that's going on. A lot of times it's easy to, uh, to kind of categorize um, a business or, or an industry or even a group of people and uh, do it in a negative way. And, you know, God loves all people. So this isn't about people. This is about the spirit behind certain organizations and, and, and certain entities and powers um, that have um, created some strongholds um, within our lives, especially in this area that we're discussing, in the area of medicine and the area of, of food and the food industries and, and what's happening. So just want to stress the point that it's, this isn't about people. This isn't about bad people. Um, this is about the spirit behind certain entities and the way that they've been created and, and really understanding the big picture behind it. And, and one example I can give you that you're probably all pretty familiar with would be uh, an example would be like Planned Parenthood. You know, from the outside, Planned Parenthood, you know, has this front of this organization that, that loves women and does everything for women. And most of us know that, that really all Planned Parenthood is, is, is a face uh, for the abortion industry, which is a big business. So it, it's not that the people who worked at Planned Parenthood are, are bad people. Um, it's the spirit behind the creation of these types of organizations. And that's the same thing we see uh, in the food industry and um, in the medical field oftentimes. So I just th thought that was important to, uh, to stress that. The, and as I've mentioned in past classes, there's a lot of amazing things going on in the medical field. And I, and I want to stress those first, and then I want to get into to some of these other concepts here. Conventional medicine is really good at a lot of things, saving lives. You know, again, the joke is if I get in a car accident, don't take me to an herbalist, <laughs> right? Saving lives, heart attacks, accidents, traumas, emergency surgeries. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that they do well, but there's a lot of things that natural health and natural healing does well, as, does well as well. That sounded kind of funny. 
But we need to integrate these things, and we need to do what's best for the person. And that's what's not happening. And that's what I'm really going to show you through some of these stories. And I, and I think I mentioned earlier that this class might go longer than an hour. Um, I'm not really have it timed out, but just so you know. Uh, there's a lot of information to share, so just whatever the Holy Spirit puts on my heart. So number one, Roman numeral one, why is natural medicine so popular? Paragraph A, natural medicine is popular for a number of reasons, including number one, I think the most important thing is that it's cooperating with God's natural design. That's the whole series of this class is partnering with God in health and wellness, that God created a body that is designed to heal itself. And it will do that if you put the right nutrients in based on his design and if you remove the chemical toxicity and poisons that are in the body that are not of his design. If you do those two things, the body is a self-correcting mechanism because that's the way God made it. So what the natural therapies do is they cooperate with God's design. It's, it's kind of like when, when you break a leg. You know, you go to the doctor when you break a leg. Why? Because he has to set it and make sure it's, it's set right. But does the doctor heal your leg? No. The doctor has nothing to do with healing your leg. You know, when you cut your arm, the body heals itself. And it's the same with all sickness, all disease. All can be healed by the self-healing mechanism of the body that God designed. Number two, natural health, natural healing doesn't focus on just treating the symptoms, but instead covering the root cause of imbalances. So we see this a lot with uh, medications, for example. If you have high blood pressure, there's a reason you have high blood pressure. It could be dehydration, eating too much sugar, eating too many fried foods, fatty foods. There's all kinds of reasons we have high blood pressure. But it's not a deficiency in a pharmaceutical drug. So if you take the pharmaceutical drug, it can, artif it can, it can lower your blood pressure, and that can be beneficial in short duration periods of time. But you have to discover why you have high blood pressure. Because otherwise, you stop taking that blood pressure medication, what happens? You still have high blood pressure. So you haven't done anything to correct the, the, the body. So in natural health, we always look for the root cause of why is the body out of balance? Because it's not natural to be out of balance because, again, God created a body that's self-healing. Number three, no harm done. I mean, Hippocratic oath, right? First, do no harm. Uh, the, uh, the Center for Poison Control in America did a study in 2009 and said there were zero deaths from herbs, vitamins, minerals, and natural therapies. Zero deaths. Yet it's a published fact that properly prescribed pharmaceutical drugs kill now 130,000 people every year. And those are the properly prescribed ones. Um, pharmaceutical drugs, surgery's gone wrong, infections in hospitals, behind cancer and heart disease is the number three killer in America. Yet natural medicine is looked on as weird and it's ostracized when we're trying to cooperate with God's design. So again, there's, just, there's something wrong here. Number four is it just makes sense. And number five, it works. And th this is the big one. I mean, <laughs> why are people doing natural therapies when they've, they've tried everything else, they've tried multiple drugs, they've tried all these different options, haven't gotten a lot of answers, or maybe they got temporary relief and then it, it went bad again. It works. Natural therapies works. Why? Well, because God's design works. So that's why people are coming to natural therapies in droves, because they want to cooperate with God, and it works. Roman numeral two, what are our current choices? So these natural therapies are very popular. They work. They don't do any harm. So people are, are really um, interested more and more in different ways of doing things. Yet in the conventional med commu medical community, these things aren't being implemented. If so many of these work, why aren't we just trying one or two? Why aren't we just integrating one simple thing like magnesium into cardiovascular health? Oh my gosh, that could save tens of thousands of lives. One simple thing. If we know about all these amazing things, why aren't at least some of them being tried? And they're not. None of them are. So again, why? We really have to question what's going on. Paragraph B there's some methods, and I, I just gave the four main options, and, you know, I could have 
missed some, but these are the four main ones that I see being offered, you know, if you go to the doctor today. Number one is a pharmaceutical drug. If you don't know the history of pharmaceutical drugs, I'm not going to get into that, but I want to let you know that the word drug or drug in Dutch actually means dried plant. That's where the drug came, word drug came from. What drugs or dried plants have we had throughout history? God's plants, God's weeds. That's what it says in my place over at Herbs. It says God's weeds. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes is Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, a, a weed is but a plant whose virtues have yet to be discovered. <laughs> I, I love that quote. So even today, over about half the pharmaceutical, the synthetic drugs on the market are still using properties of plants, of real plants, natural plants, because that's how all medicine was discovered in the first place, because that's all we've had. So what's really interesting, though, is, is how the patent process works. You can't patent ginger. You can't put a patent on garlic. It has to have a synthetic chemical to be patented. So every single pharmaceutical drug on the market you're taking has to be synthetic, chemically derived by something in a laboratory because you can't patent what God has given us. So hence part of the, the reason why there's such a battle going on. Number two, antibiotics. This is common for any type of infectious issue, whether it's cold, flu, virus, it doesn't seem to matter what you have. Here's an antibiotic and see you later. And I know, I'm sorry, I'm kind of downplaying that a little bit, but unfortunately that's what's happening a lot because I hear that a lot. I see that every day with people. And there's other things going on. There's other more serious infections going on and the antibiotics sometimes work short-term but are never a long-term solution again. And infectious diseases are very, very serious. And, and you'll see more when we start talking about some of these these amazing uh, people in, in history. Number three, surgeries. Look up the history of surgery. Talk about something fascinating. Surgeries were actually looked on very, very, very negatively as a last resort. It was highly um, frowned upon by the Catholic Church, for example, because it was seen as altering the body and altering God's image in which we're designed. So it was looked on very negatively. And um, did any of you know where you had to go to get uh, a surgery back in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s? Your barber? You guys heard that? You know the, the pole and there's the red stripe going around? That signifies blood. That's because that's where you went for a surgery. It was kind of an underground thing to go get a surgery because it was looked on so negatively. And now surgery, it's, it's almost preventative medicine in a way. Gallbladders are taken out 80% of the time. They don't need to. It's not an emergency. Hysterectomies are done as preventative medicine. Number four, well, a couple other points I had there that I just thought was interesting. A lot of the things that they've been doing in, in, in medicine um, in this area is also bloodletting, if you've ever heard of that, um, where they actually thought by draining people's blood, they could remove the illness from them. This is how George Washington died. They uh, bled five pints of blood out of George Washington and were uh, administering mercury therapy to him. That's how George Washington died. All kinds of fascinating stuff in the history of medicine. And number four, chemotherapy and radiation. And we'll talk more about that when, when, when we're going to talk about cancer quite a bit tonight because it's a big subject. But that's really the only option that's offered to people with cancer today. With all the things that have been discovered about the body and all the things that have been discovered in, in medicine over 3,000 years, this is all we're given as an option today. Roman numeral three, so the pioneers of nutrition, and there's a lot of them. I mean, I went, I don't know, J, K, I mean, I got a good 10, 12 of them on here. We're going to try to discuss somewhat 
but uh, I mean, there, there, there's hundreds. There's hundreds. There's so many amazing people I left off this list, which is, is really sad. I'm going to talk about um, first Dr. Royal Lee, and uh, I gave you his website, drroyallee.org, and uh, his nickname was the Einstein of Nutrition. There were a few guys back in the 30s and 40s that, man, these guys were brilliant, and this was sort of the beginning of, of the heavy processing of our food supply and the shelf life business, which we've discussed. And uh, they, they knew what was going on. They, they had it figured out. He was the first one to really discuss in detail what was going on with autoimmune diseases and why people got them and how it was tied to food. And even 80 years later, in the conventional medical community, we act like we have no idea why people get autoimmune conditions, why they get Hashimoto's disease or Crohn's disease or, you know, your body's attacking itself. We don't know why. Let's suppress your immune system. That's what we're told. We've had research on this for 80 years that we're ignoring. During his lifetime in the, in the, in the 20s, suddenly people started dying of heart disease. Whereas pre-1900, it was very rare for people to have heart disease. And the only thing, the main thing that he could find as a link was all of this uh, processed food. And he strongly felt that it was the processing of the food, the removal of the vitamins and the minerals and the germ and the bran and all the healthy parts of the plant, the way God originally designed it, removing all of them so things could sit on the shelf, he really thought that this was the link to most disease. And in number three there, I, I, I gave a quote. He says that a vitamin as it appears in nature is never a single chemical, but rather a group of interdependent compounds that form a nutrient complex. One of the best Descriptions of this is vitamin C, for example. Vitamin C was discovered by a Yugoslavian scientists. It was discovered in a pepper plant. And he said, uh, I'm going to give this pepper plant, because I found this nutrient called vitamin C, and I'm going to give it to people who have scurvy, because that was a, a big deal back then. And everybody he gave the pepper plant to, that had scurvy, reverse scurvy, no more scurvy. So he kept isolating it out all the way, and he took the vitamin C out of the plant all the way until he discovered this molecule called ascorbic acid. And he gave ascorbic acid to all his uh, patients who had scurvy. And guess what happened? Nothing. Nobody got better from scurvy because ascorbic acid doesn't have the whole nutrient complex because God designed plants a specific way for us not to be altered and extracted. In 1933, 1933, listen to this quote, 1933, we're 80 plus years later. Is my math right on that? Maybe. Okay. Um, he said, candy, all white sugar or its products, all white flour, including these products such as he specifically named macaroni, spaghetti, and crackers, should absolutely be barred from the diet of a child. All of these produ energy-producing foods contain no building materials for the body. The consequences of their toleration and their susceptibility to infections are our susceptibility to infections, enlarged tonsils, carious teeth, which is cavities, unruly dispositions, which is interesting what's going on with ADD, ADHD, children displaying psychotic behavior. Again, this is 80 years ago. Stunted growth, rickets, maldevelopment, and permanent damage to organs of the body, especially the endocrine system, that depend upon the vitamin supply for normal function and development. It just boggles my mind. Does anyone else, does that boggle their mind that he knew this 80 years ago? And what are we doing today? What are we eating today? We're ignoring the brilliance of, of history. Number four, how organized medicine is fighting vitamins. This is a title of a part of his website if you go to drroyallee.org. If you click on this link, this link, 
it will give you the whole history of his story and how he um, basically came to some conclusions through research and study. Again, very intelligent man. And, uh, well, his quote is right here. As a dental student, he was a dental student. As a dental student, I came to the conclusion that the civilized world was starving. I had no idea that my efforts to show people how to avoid this fate would bring down on my head a club wielded by the United States government, apparently instigated by organized medicine, who were making quite different plans for the management of public health. I had no idea that organized medicine not only refused to investigate discoveries made by quote unquote outsiders, or that it would go so far as to condemn any discoveries as quackery. And, and you'll see this as a common theme. Anybody who's outside of the standard procedure of care, who uses anything related to nutrition or anything related to God's natural design, which is free or basically free to us, is considered quackery. He was actually taken to court and uh, he actually produced thousands of witnesses and clinical studies um, backing up all his research. Um, but if, if they don't fund the studies, uh, certain organizations, if they don't fund the right studies, they're going to say there's no proof. They labeled him a uh, racketeer. That's one of the, the words um, that's used often for, for a lot of these guys who, who focus on nutrition, that they're a racketeer, that they're just trying to drum up business and make lots of money off innocent people um, by you know, telling lies about nutrition and things like that. Um, his research and papers, most of them were destroyed. They were confiscated by the FDA. And he had to close a lot of his businesses because a lot of his research was, was stolen and destroyed. Um, but a lot of his information is, is available. There's a, a lot of good, if you read his books, man, I mean, read one of his books and somebody should give you like a four-year chemistry degree. I mean, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. I wish we could talk more about him, but we got a lot of guys to talk about. Um, paragraph C, Harvey Wiley. Harvey Wiley, this is even earlier. This is late 1800s. Uh, America's small town markets were already flooded with processed white flowers and sugars, early 1800s. People say, wow, how can that be? Well, supermarkets kind of started in the you know, 19 teens, but even before that, we had little corner markets and people were still had white flour and white sugar. I mean, white sugar was brought to England in the late 1600s. That's when uh, Thomas Willis first wrote about diabetes, the first time it was actually uh, written about. Uh, heavily when sugar started being imported into England. So it's been around for a while. But what was happening, and he was very upset because in the late 1800s, honey was being diluted with glucose syrup. Olive oil was being made and called olive oil, and they were using cottonseed oil, which is still happening today. They were, um, a lot of companies got into trouble because they were selling 100% extra virgin olive oil, and it was canola. And then syrup was given to babies laced with morphine. So he was a little upset about this. And what's interesting about some of these guys, especially back in this time, these guys had government positions, a lot of these guys. They were trying to do the right thing, get America on the right track when the food companies were going the wrong way because their goal was, was profit and cheap ingredients at, at the expense of health. And some of these people knew it, and they got into government positions, and they really, really wanted to make a difference and really wanted to make changes, and he was one of them. He actually introduced a lot of pure food bills. So, as the name implies, pure food bills, not altering the food, not removing nutrients, to use only pure foods for these food companies. And uh, all of the bills were killed in Congress uh, because a lot of the lobbying groups had already been set up and, um, and actually, in 1906, uh, President Roosevelt at the time signed uh, an act called the Pure Food and Drug Act. And it was written by, by uh, Dr. Wiley. But with enough pressure, uh, he actually ended up uh, being forced to resign from his position. He was the chief chemist of the United States Department of Agriculture at the time. And then he went on to write for Good Housekeeping. And that's where you get the Good Housekeeping seal of approval right? That came from this man. So a lot of people would read his journals because they knew that he was into whole food nutrition all the way back there 130 years ago. And uh, so they really relied on his word. 
Paragraph D, Melvin A. Page. So we're going to talk about a couple dentists now. And uh, he really felt that what was going on with the poor quality of teeth in America was to ch people needed to change their eating habits and stay away from the white sugar and the white flour. But those, he was really ostracized by, by his colleagues. Um, he was 84 uh, when he was still walking a mile back and forth to work each day. And here's, here's where his four basic basic points. I just thought I'd share them with you. Number one, the harmful effects of white sugar and refined carbohydrates cannot be ignored. The harmful effects of chemical additives and food preservatives for the sake of shelf life upsets body chemistry. Using a whole food vitamin concentrate minerals digestive enzymes to supplement daily food might be necessary and that milk is not necessarily the perfect food for everyone. And I don't know exactly what he means by that. He didn't really distinguish raw milk versus pasteurized milk. Um, so I'm not 100% sure on that one. Number two there, um, he ended up in a lawsuit because he was a dentist and he's only supposed to be using drugs and drilling people and instead he was giving them nutrition advice. So he was operating outside of his standard of practice, his scope of practice, and he was brought to trial and he introduced at his trial 3,600 case studies along with 40,000 blood tests just to show how accurate his work was. These, some of these guys were meticulous. And he actually won. The, uh, the judge actually reprimanded the American Medical Association and the FDA for not trying to figure out what the man was doing right, for trying to harass him and take him to court because he was actually getting people well. Paragraph E, Weston Price, I refer to him often in class. I really, I didn't put his website there. I think it's westonaprice.org. It's the Weston Price Foundation. Highly, highly encourage you guys to, to read over that information. It's a fascinating man, fascinating body of research. Another dentist, and he was a dentist in America, and people had cavities and horrible teeth and were getting root canals. And, and he said, I wonder what the rest of the world is like when it comes to the health of their mouth. So he went to find out. He went to, I mean, he went everywhere. He would have went to Antarctica if there were people living there. He went to the Eskimos, Native Americans, New Zealand. I mean, there's a whole list of them here. African tribes, literally every continent. And this is what he found in general. Beautiful straight teeth, free from decay, stalwart bodies, resistant to disease, from all these populations who ate their traditional diets, eating off the land. He said that he would have to look in seven mouths, on average, seven mouths to find even the hint of one cavity, on average, across the entire globe. A and what's going on in America with our teeth? Clearly, there's no there's no other link besides diet. How can there be any other link? Number two, um, he suggested that people living on their diet not tainted from what he calls foods of commerce, white sugar and white flour. You know, I, I, I use the, the example often that, um, that in America and industrialized nations, we have diseases of excess having too much of anything we want 24-7, overconsumption, processed foods, and why other countries are lacking and dying of diseases of deficiency, it's really sad. Everybody in the world's dying of something. It's either we have too little or we have too much. Um, and there are some cultures, though, who are still eating their native diets. I think they're few and far between these days. But uh, I've mentioned it before, but read John Robbins' book, Healthy at 100. You can study a lot of them in, in that book. Fantastic book. He went and lived with these cultures. Found out what they're doing right. Why are they living into their hundreds? No heart disease, diabetes, cancer, hiking, climbing up and down mountains. And have one doctor in a town of 10,000 people. Paragraph F, Francis Pottinger. Another uh, great guy around the same time of, of, of Dr. Royal Lee. Um, he, had, he was very famous, and you can, you can buy this book and read this book. It's called the, Fran, uh, the Pottinger Cat Study. And in the Pottinger Cat Study, he took 900 cats, 
over a 10-year period and fed them what cats are supposed to eat, raw milk and raw meat. And um, they all had good bone structure, generation after generation, healthy fur, no disease, healthy kittens. We like healthy kittens. So then he did a, uh, took another group of cats, and he cooked the meat and also processed, uh, replaced some of their food with processed food, like what we could call today uh, dry cat food. And um, disease and degeneration got worse and worse successively with each generation. By the third generation, most kittens did not survive six months. Three generations. They were full of parasites, skin allergies, um, all kinds of nutritional deficiencies, soft bones, personality changes. Personality changes. They were angry, irritable, attacking their own young. I'm just thinking about the comparisons to people today. Okay, I'm not, I'm, I know that sounds funny. I'm not joking. But, but no, seriously, children being compromised. Children being told they have psychotic uh, behavior. It's because of their diet or the diet of mom and dad, or probably going back even farther than that. We've now had processed foods for over 100 years. And Francis Pottinger showed us that if we eat these foods, we're going to degenerate. Males became docile, and the females became aggressive. I heard some laughter there. The cats, this, this is, I starred this one. Pay attention to this sentence. The cats suffered from most of the degenerative diseases encountered in human medicine and died out totally by the fourth generation. So processed foods in America, I'd say we're what? Fourth, fifth generation now? Children are really sick these days. We have to make changes. It's amazing that, to me, that animals in the wild, not that they don't get sick and die of disease on occasion, but for the most part, don't. If you look at a moose or a deer or a lion, um, yet we have cats and dogs that have cancer and heart disease. And why? It's what we feed them. So we can see the same comparisons in, in, in humans. Paragraph G, Dr. Samuel Henneman. He was the father of homeopathy. If you've never heard of homeopathy, we'll talk real quick about what homeopathy is. This is going way back, 1790. He went in and discovered his own way to practice medicine because he was disillusioned with the medical practices of the days where doctors were purging, bloodletting, using leeches, using toxic chemicals like mercury. That was standard of practice in the late 1700s and 1800s. Um, he was disillusioned by that. And he said, I think there might be a more gentle, safer approach. And um, the concept of homeopathy was written about uh, all throughout ancient texts. Um, Hippocrates wrote about it. <clears throat> he discovered that, um, just w one example, and, and I could give you a lot, but just one example is, um, is quinine, which is from the, the bark of a tree. It's, a south, it's called cinchona. And he found that if you ate or drank tea of the bark of this tree, the symptoms, the reaction that would happen in your body is the same exact symptoms of somebody who has malaria. So what he found is if somebody had malaria and they took a diluted portion of this tree bark, they were cured almost instantly. Um, especially a, a lot, they, they saw this with infectious diseases. Um, homeopathy was very, very successful for infectious diseases, viruses and bacteria and parasites and things like that. And it seems confusing. Um, homeopathy is, is confusing, and uh, that's why it's, it's kind of sh looked down upon or shunned upon today, but the history of it's fascinating. The way... I like to think of it is that God, because people would say, well, why would you take a plant that would cause these negative effects in your body? Well, God gave us everything for a reason, and he wants us to discover how to use it. All plants have a purpose. All plants were not designed for our food. 
But all plants were designed for something to benefit us because that's our God. That's his nature. So some plants we have to use wisely and learn how to use them as medicine, and some we use as food. In the case of homeopathy, you can take poisonous plants and turn them into medicine. It's, it's interesting. My future father-in-law, we were just having a conversation last night about a product he was using um, for uh, pain that you just rub on your body. And uh, sorry, I use you as an, as an example. Um, but what the ingredient is in that, it's homeopathic product, and it's a pain reliever, and the ingredient is snake venom. Um, I know, I hear oohs and ahs. It's really cool, though. Um, bee, the, uh, the stingers of bees is actually used um, in homeopathy a lot. It's uh, apis and then melinica or melica, and it's used to treat pain as well. Uh, the stingers of bees. So there's all kinds of things that God has given us, and we need to have discretion and discernment and know how to use them. And, but that's how homeopathy works. The concept of like cures like. If somebody has poison ivy, you can give them a, a tablet or liquid drops of diluted, I'm talking diluted thousands of times, of drops of poison ivy. And it will, the poison ivy will go away. So just fascinating body of research. Now, it was so popular and so successful, and it worked so well. It was huge in Europe, huge. And Samuel Henneman brought this to America. And it was so successful that there were 22 homeopathic medical schools in the early 1900s. 100 hospitals were exclusively homeopathic. 100 hospitals. The first hospitals in America, not more than 120 years ago. 100 homeopathic hospitals. And over 1,000 pharmacies sold homeopathic, uh, homeopathic medicines. At universities you might have heard of, Boston, Stanford, <laughs> New York Medical College, they were teaching homeopathy. Um, unfortunately, they were driven out by the drug companies and the FDA. And you'll be hard pressed to find um, a homeopathic school in America now. There might be a couple of left. I didn't, a couple of le left. I have not really researched that, but I'm pretty sure there are a couple left. Paragraph H, Harry Hoxie. There's a lot on him. I, I really like the story of this man. I, I think one of the reasons I really like him is, 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 let me just tell you his story in a nutshell. I really, if you want to read one of the best books I have ever read in my entire life, read a book called When Healing Becomes a Crime. This was required reading um, in, in my schooling. And the author is Kenny Osobel. I, I gave it there for you, but when healing becomes a crime, it is the most fascinating book of this man's story, the history of medicine in America, and it'll really shine a light on a, uh, on a lot of things for you. <laughs> man, what a great story. This guy was a farmer, okay? He was just your average farmer, and he found a cure for cancer, just a farmer. Now, how did this happen? He had a horse, the horse was in a stable. The horse was growing a massive tumor. And the horse, he could tell, was obviously sick. And he goes, I love this horse. I'm going to just let him out to pasture, and I'm going to let him die peacefully in, in the pasture. And the horse went out, and while his other horses were munching on grass, this horse wasn't. He was munching on weeds. And he's like, that's weird. Horses don't eat weeds. Well, horses and animals have inherent intelligence. Uh, I think we do, too. I don't know if we can always find it, but I know we have it, too. It's in there. It's in there somewhere. But animals, you've seen this, where your dogs will eat grass sometimes, and, you know, there's reasons these things happen. So the horse was eating weeds, and the tumor started to go away, and the tumor actually ended up completely going away. So he took these plants, and he started studying them, and he actually made a paste out of them. And he started giving them to people that had tumors and cancers. And tumors went away. And cancer went away. External and internal cancers went away. He developed two different formulas, one for internal cancer and one for external cancer. In the 1950s, 60 years ago, this was not long, in Dallas, Texas, was the world's largest cancer clinic. It was based off of 
a few herbs that this man discovered that cured cancer. There were branches in 17 states. I know it's mind-boggling, isn't it? Um, this is what's really fascinating about this story. His therapy was so successful and so um, safe and so affordable that um, two different courts upheld his therapeutic value. The American Medical Association and Food, Admi uh, Food and Drug Administration actually admitted that his treatment cured cancer. They admitted it in court. Um, a Dallas judge said the therapy is comparable to surgery, radium, and x-ray in its effectiveness without the destructive side effects. By the end of the 1950s, all of his clinics were shut down, and he moved to Mexico. And you can read the whole story. In the report in 1953, it said the American Medical Association, the National Cancer Industry, and the Food and Drug Administration organized a conspiracy to suppress a fair, unbiased ass assessment of Hoxie's methods. This man, who was a simple farmer, was arrested more times than any human being in medical history. He was arrested 125 times. And guess what? He was found innocent every single time. So why did they continue to, to arrest him? Harassment and to bankrupt him. It's really sad. Um, this man who helped thousands and thousands of people. What's really fascinating about it is when this man went to court, thousands of people lined up outside the courtroom. They protested, and the court sessions were so ridiculously long because thousands of people came every single time to testify. He actually, um, or the, his patients, his healed, cured, cancer patients, all over 25,000 of them organized to march on Washington in front of the FDA. I mean, this farmer, it, it's, it's just beyond... Um, I don't even know. I don't even have the words for it. Um, there's a statement. In 1954, they took 10 medical doctors, and they had him review all of his information and all of his paperwork. And this was their quote, and I have this in number three. The clinic is successful treating pathologically proven cases of cancer, both internal and external, without the use of surgery, radiation, or x-rays. Accepting the standard yardstick of cases that have remained symptom-free in excess of five to six years after treatment established by medical authorities, we have seen sufficient cases to warrant such a conclusion. Some of those presented before us have been free of symptoms for as long as 24 years, and the physical evidence indicates that they are enjoying exceptional health at this time. We as a committee feel that the Hoxie treatment is superior to conventional methods, such as x-ray, radiation, and surgery. We are willing to assist this clinic in any way possible to bring this treatment to the American public. Um, one more interesting thing. I, I'm sorry, there's a lot on this guy, but it's, I just, I love this, this man. Um, uh, the district attorney, assistant district attorney, his name was Al Templeton. He, he's the one who personally arrested Hoxie over and over and over and over again. In 1939, this district attorney's brother developed cancer. And his cancer continued to spread. There's doctor said there's nothing that could be done. He secretly went to Hoxie and cured his cancer. So Al Templeton, who was working as the district attorney, um, had a little bit of a change of heart, and he actually became Hoxie's lawyer. And, and it's, it's amazing because that's how a lot of people get into the natural health field is they deny it, they deny it, they deny it, and then they have a personal experience where they experience health and healing. And, and the, 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 dog, the dogmatic um, way of thinking that's been ingrained in them uh, suddenly opens up. He, um, Esquire magazine <laughs> sent a reporter to do an expose on them to discredit him but when this reporter spent time with Hoxie and saw all the people that he was helping, he, he actually uh, completely flipped um, his story and, and wrote a story called The Quack Who Cures Cancer. But of course, Esquire magazine never published that story. 
So there's, there's more there. I'll let you read that. It talks a lot about Morris Fishbein. Um, he was behind the, the whole uh, American Medical Association and its formation in the early days. All that's explained really well in, in the book, When Healing Becomes a Crime. So again, I just really encourage you guys to, to read that. But in, in Roman numeral, or not Roman numeral, but number six, uh, in the last sentence, I just put that uh, the Hoxie treatment along with the whole list, and, and you can go on their website and look this up. Uh, the American Cancer, I don't know if it's on the American Cancer Society or it's one of the, 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 the big uh, cancer websites. But they have an unproven methods of cancer management. So Hoxie, you know, Gerson therapy, vitamin B17, ozone therapy, all these things that have been discovered that cure cancer are on, on a blacklist of unproven methods. <clears throat> Let's go to paragraph I, Dr. Max Gerson, another, another one of my favorite. They're all my favorite. They're all cool. Uh, Dr. Gerson, German physician. Uh, he wrote a book called A Cancer Therapy, The Result of 50 Cases. What's interesting is while he was writing his book, um, well, let me save that to the end. I almost, I almost jumped totally to the end. Um, Gerson therapy, and, and this first number one, just so you know, is right out of Wikipedia. I just wanted to, to make that clear. Because um, that last sentence, it says, Gerson's claims were examined by the National Cancer Institute, found that his records lacked the basic information necessary to systematically evaluate his claims. So that's kind of fancy verbiage for there's no proof that what he does works. Now I want to tell you who did prove what he does works. The Japanese. Ha um, Dr. Max Gerson has been curing people of cancer for 70 years. Uh, he's no longer around, but uh, Charlotte Gerson, who's in her late 80s and is sharp as a firecracker, if you've ever seen any Gerson Miracle or A Beautiful Truth, any of those documentaries, um, or, or Food Matters, I think she was in that movie too. She's just a pistol. She's 88, runs a business, runs around. I mean, <laughs> she's just amazing. She drinks vegetable juice all day. What's wrong with her? So, um, but this, the, the therapy is so successful, and, and of course, you know, we wanted, um, uh, you know, the, we always are wanting studies and, and, and proof, and unfortunately, if, if you don't have millions of dollars, you know, you can't, you can't uh, pay for or fund a lot of these studies. And uh, so the Japanese actually were very interested in, in Gerson's work. So what they did is they took people that had all different sorts of cancer, and they ran the tests, and uh, they documented the cancers and the types of cancers. They put them on the Gerson therapy for X number of months. They ran the tests again, showed that these people were completely cancer-free, and they have all the research and all the studies. But uh, America refuses to accept research out, outside of this country. So they're still claiming that there's no proof that Gerson therapy works. Gerson therapy, <clears throat> in a nutshell, and it's, it's more involved than this, but in a nutshell, you drink vegetable juice all day long, like 13 vegetable juice drinks all day long, and you do coffee enemas. Um, Gerson firmly believed that the way to health was through healing the liver. So his focus on healing cancer and the way he heals cancer and a number of other disease conditions is by really, really focusing in on healing the liver. So the coffee enemas cause the liver to dump all the poisons and toxins out and the vegetable juices supply all the nutrients the body needs, nutrients to the bloodstream, which cleanses the liver and cycles through the liver every three and a half minutes. It's very simple. Um, like I said, it, it is more involved than that, but that's the basis of it. And it's been effective for decades and decades. One of his most famous patients was a, a devout Christian. Um, if you know the story of Albert Schweitzer, he was a Nobel Prize winner. And uh, he cured, um, Dr. Max Gerson cured Schweitzer and pretty much everybody in his family of something different. <laughs> they all had different ailments, and the Gerson therapy worked on all of them. So Schweitzer and him were buddies, and he was a big proponent of, uh, of Max Gerson. One of his quotes was, stay close to nature and its, its eternal laws will protect you. What's really sad about Max Gerson, and of course there's, there's no way to prove exactly what happened or nobody knows exactly what happened, but at the end of his life, which was, he died prematurely, um, 
they actually found out that he died of arsenic poisoning. And they're pretty sure that um, his secretary at the time was, was paid to put arsenic in, in his drink. Um, what's interesting about it is he was writing his book, the, um, what was it called? The 50, oh, a cancer therapy result of 50 cases. This was really important for him to finish this work because this was the documented research of the, the tests before that the person had the cancer, the therapy and what he did for each person during the therapy and the test results showing the cancer no longer gone, no longer there. This was very important he finished this work. He was sick, he was dying, he didn't know what was wrong. His research was actually stolen and destroyed for the book. And luckily, right before the end of his life, like the last year of his life, he completely rewrote the entire thing, right before he died of arsenic poisoning. Fascinating story. Uh, paragraph J, Otto von Warburg. This man won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, I'm sorry, Nobel Prize for discovering, he, he really studied uh, the metabolism of tumors, why tumors grow, how tumors grow, all the way down to the cellular level, how tumors breathe, how cells breathe. He discovered that cancer cells somehow could live anaerobically, anaerobically meaning without oxygen. And he discovered that cancer cells could not survive in the presence of oxygen. Something so simple something so free given to us by God that can eliminate cancer, it's oxygen. And he won the Nobel Prize for this in 1931. Yet again, how much have we studied and researched this as a possible option against cancer? Knowing almost 90 years ago or 80 years ago that cancer cannot survive in the presence of oxygen. And there's some quotes there. Um, he said, all normal cells have an absolute requirement for oxygen, but cancer cells can live without oxygen. This is a rule without exception. He made it clear that the primary cause is oxygen deficiency, and he also stated that the oxygen deficiency was a result of toxicity. So like we've talked about in prior classes, heavy metals, chemicals, the processed foods that we're eating, something that's that's not of God's design, that's damaging the cells, that suffocates the cells. Most disease conditions is our cells suffocating, and oxygen can restore that. K, Mr. Brzezinski. You can watch, uh, this is great because this man's still alive. Praise the Lord. Um, this guy, uh, Stan Brzezinski, medical doctor, PhD, Came over from Poland, fascinating story. Came over from Poland with nothing. Brilliant, brilliant man. Made something of himself. Discovered a way to um, turn off cancer cells while not harming healthy cells. It's called anti-neoplastins. It's on that, you'll find it on that blacklist. Um, he, uh, he's in Houston, Texas. And this man did everything by the book. Medical doctor, fully licensed, follows every law, national law, every state law. Unbelievable track record in curing cancer, cancer permanently. Um, unfortunately, again, harassed over and over and over by the FDA and the American Medical Association. The Food and Drug Administration um, engaged him in four federal grand juries spanning over a decade at the cost of millions of dollars to taxpayers. We paid for that. We paid for the FDA to take this man to court. Every single court case ended in no fault. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He was following every single law. He was just curing people of cancer. Um, in the fifth grand jury, um, they again found him not guilty. And the courts actually stated that it's pretty obvious that there's a vendetta by the FDA and the American Medical Association against this man for some reason. And the court said that. Of what he was um, charged, if he would have been found guilty, it was 290 years in prison and $18.5 million in fines. There's a movie called Brzezinski the Movie 
Uh, I didn't put it on here, but there's another movie. If, you, if you're interested in more movies about cancer, there's a, a movie called Cut, Poison, Burn. That's a documentary you might uh, be interested in. Um, there's some highlights to the movie listed there. This is from uh, Natural News, which is a good uh, natural health website. Um, Mike Adams, I think his name is, and he, he sends out a lot of good inf health-related information. But what's interesting about it is, is I have a, a statement on there that the FDA has approved 25 different new cancer drugs trying to mimic what Dr. Brzezinski is doing. And guess what? It's not working. Because what the FDA is trying to do is, find, is use synthetic copies of natural things. And the synthetics don't work as well as the natural. Synthetics made by man don't work as well as what God designed. And uh, that will always be the case. And you see that in, in so many different products. I mean, there's a product called Miracle Soap that's just soap. And they found that it heals all types of illnesses and, and diseases. They actually came up with a whole book of illnesses that this soap helps with. And the FDA tried to copy it. First, they offered to, to buy them out. They didn't want to sell. And that's what happened to Brzezinski. That's what happened to Raymond Reif. That's what happened to Hoxie. Is the FDA, and, and, and there's no proof to this, but the FDA tried to purchase the rights. And usually what the offer was was, um, we get 90% of the profits, you get 10% of the profits, but only after 10 years when we've proved that it actually works. I can't imagine these guys turn that down. What an offer. Um, but, but they try to mimic, um, because they won't sell their formulas, they try to mimic what they're doing, and um, it, you know that doesn't work. So the, the last man, last but not least, Dr. Uh, Royal Raymond Reif, uh, this might be one of the most amazing stories uh, and also probably one of the saddest stories as well. Uh, Raymond Reif was another unbelievably brilliant inventor. He had over 100 patents. Um, he had a, a, micros a, a microscope with 6,000 different parts, and he could magnify objects 60,000 times their normal size. He was the first man to see a virus under a microscope, and he built the microscope. This guy was pretty smart. He discovered a machine, and it's known as the Rife machine, that emanates frequencies. And basically what he discovered is that everything in the world has a frequency. Your body does the things that are in your body, every cell, every living organism, every innate inanimate object. Everything has a frequency to it. And he spent years and years and years finding what frequencies if sent into the body, would destroy the herpes virus, the polio virus, the flu virus. And he discovered, he found which frequency would eradicate every single one of those infectious organisms. And he documented it, what the frequency was and how to do it. It was so successful. Now, this is one of the things that's going to be hard to believe, so look it up, please. In 1931, 44 medical authorities and people from around the world were setting up a banquet for Dr. Reif, and the name of the banquet was The End of All Diseases. The reason they called it The End of All Diseases is because they took terminally ill cancer patients and had them do Reif treatment for 90 days. After 90 days, 86.5% of the patients were completely cured, and with slight adjustments to the machine, the other 13.5% were um, completely cured in the next four weeks. So he literally had the cure for disease, and they were going to set up this huge banquet. Again, the FDA uh, and some of these associations tried to buy him out. Um, he refused. Um, his story is a little bit different. He was licensed. He was a doctor. Uh, they could not arrest him uh, for being unlicensed. That's what they brought uh, Harry Hoxie to court for 125 times because he was a farmer and not a doctor. So um, he shouldn't be able to, you know, practice medicine. And also, they didn't want a public trial because a public trial would be very dangerous um, for the industry 
showing that there's a machine that could be built in your own home that costs a few cents of electricity that could cure 100% of the people 100% of the time. So they didn't want a big court trial uh, with Raymond Rife. So you'll find that this man didn't actually go to court. Um, unfortunately, what happened is, is he was discredited. All his photo photographs, his film, his, his microscope was stolen. The parts were damaged. Um, there was a, um, a laboratory um, that was going to announce the confirmation of all his, his work. And um, a fire destroyed the multi-million dollar building. <clears throat> And then um, his 50 years of research um, at the end of his life was, was totally confiscated. And this, this man actually died a very sad <laughs> death at the end. He, he really was just wrecked by, by what happened to all his research and, and studies and, and all his brilliance that could have been used for such great good, um, you know, turned upside down on him. And uh, it's, it's interesting because um, in, in his lifetime, in, in Raymond Reif's lifetime, he saw cancer increase from 1 in 24 people to 1 in 3 people. And he invented a machine that worked 100% of the time. There's a book called The Cancer Cure That Worked by Barry Lines that you can read. And there's tons and tons of information about Raymond Reif. Um, that I would, you know, again, encourage you guys to, to really explore. Um, there's a lot of other people I could have talked about. Um, Renee Case, uh, S.E. Acti, if you've heard of that. Uh, she was a nurse, and uh, she developed breast cancer, and she put a four-herb formula together, and uh, her breast cancer went away, and her mom, her mom or her aunt, also had breast cancer. She gave the herbs to her. Her breast cancer went away. Started sharing it with other women. Started using it on other cancers. And it was incredibly successful for, for cancer. She was a nurse, so she opened up multiple hospitals uh, using SEACT to, to help people with breast cancer and other cancers. And, uh, you know, again, also she was, she was shut down. So it's just story after story after story after story. Um, Roman numeral four, just in summation... Again, I just have to stress that this isn't about individual people. God loves all of us, everyone, uh, but he hates evil. And um, we have to be shining lights. We have to have knowledge and truth. Um, and then when we have light and we have truth, we have to, to share it. And um, we just have to be very careful not to speak out against a group of people or a certain industry or an association because it's so easy to do that. Um, and, and I don't think that would be the love of Christ. I think we just have to, just to, to stay in truth and, and, and share what we know and uh, just understand that God is our healer. He's our creator. He's our healer. All answers lie in him and with him. And um, it, it's interesting that all of these amazing people who have discovered all of these natural therapies that worked, all were doing what? They were working in line with God's design, every single one of them. And they were ostracized for it. So the whole point of this series is partnering with God in health and wellness. So, you know, let's forget the negative things that are happening. Let's be aware of them, but let's not focus on them. Let's focus on building each other up. Let's focus on getting in line with what God's created and what he's given for us and therefore what he has in store for us, what he has planned for us in our lives. Because it requires our physical health to carry out what he has in store for us in this season in our lives. Um, I gave a couple of scriptures here at the end because my favorite one is Romans 120. That's the scripture that, that saved me. Um, I've only been a believer for four years, but I, I discovered Christ through the work of his hands, through nature. Imagine that for me. It's amazing. Um, Romans 120 says, For since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what he has made so that people are without excuse. So his inherent invisible qualities are seen in everything he's created. That's us, that's plants, that's food, and that's what he's given us to heal our bodies. And he wants us so desperately to, to turn to him in this area. 
And then finally with Matthew 9, 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Again, the, the nature of God is health. The nature of God is healing. I'm going to end in a prayer. Um, amen. That's the end of the class. Uh, Father, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for your beauty. We say that you are perfect. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his blood. We thank you for saving our souls. We thank you for creating our bodies in your image, that you created us in your image because you love us that much. And we say yes to cooperation with you. We say yes to partnership with you. We say yes, we're broken, we're sinful, we're imperfect, but we choose you, we say yes to you, and we want to align ourselves with you in every aspect of our lives. We want to experience the beauty that you have for us in this world. We want to experience divine health as only you can give. You are Jehovah Rapha. We love you. We trust you. We ask you to continue to bring light and love to this world and to let us be shining lights for others in this area of health and wellness so that we can glorify you in your ability to heal. We say we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.